So yesterday I read a dream from previous night with Mick Jagger and, and Dolly Parton in it and tried to, I, I was, so I, I had talked about the Rolling Stones paint it black earlier and um, trying to understand interpretations of um, why the lyrics were changing and what was important about the ly lyrics, the sun blotted out from the sky or don't want to see the sun flying through the sky as it says in the new lyric video. Um, and then I had this other dream about Mick Jagger and Dolly Parton. And <clears throat> I don't recall, I, so I haven't gone back and listened to the, to the tape video I made about this, but I'm, I definitely, my brain is kind of doing a um, ping pong thing with the Rolling Stones right now because it's become clear that the Rolling Stones are important. I knew the Beatles were important, now I know the Rolling Stones are important. So what do those two groups have in common? They have, they basically sprang from the same source as far as the record industry goes. Um, they were presented as being, um, there's a, are those different Huskies? The same Huskies that were just here a minute ago. I think they're the same ones. Um, so they were presented as being, you know, contrasting bands and, you know, bad blah, 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 blah. I mean, you can, it's, that's well documented how the Rolling Stones and the Beatles were contrasted with each other. But it seems to have created this pattern. I don't know if it pre-existed the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, but they created this pattern that they've emulated again and again and again throughout music um, of rival bands. And, you know, they're both essentially similar bands, but you know, contrasted against each other in different ways. But um, they certainly weren't the same bands. Usually what they talk about when I was, you know, back in the 80s when I was reading a lot of rock biographies and stuff, they would contrast the Beatles and the Rolling Stones in terms of class. And they would say, well, back then the Rolling Stones were presented as bad boys and the Beatles were packaged as good boys, but the Rolling Stones were more upper class than the Beatles were and uh, somehow that was significant. But really, what you never, what I don't remember reading was the fact that they were essentially, you know, um, linked to the same background individuals, more or less, in the music industry when they started out, and the Beatles first, and then the Rolling Stones. Um, and that's what's interesting, and I'm going to mention this right now because um, it seems significant. Um, when I was kidnapped in January of um, 2014, and I was taken to a um, behavioral health hospital, which is, I think behavioral health is code for mind control. Um, it's behavioral control is what it really is, and behavioral control and mind control are essentially the same thing. It's just control, it's about control. Um, so this is basically, um, thuggery disguised as medicine. Um, I was really confused by a lot of stuff relating to this. For example, the fact that my family was involved in it. Um, the way the community seemed to be involved with it. I mean, didn't seem to be, were. I mean, they helped instigate the whole situation on purpose. Um, it was all really confusing to me. And then I was also being further confused by this targeted an individual disinformation campaign that was running and ramping up at that time. It had been running for, uh, I guess it's been running at least since 2004, but it really ramped up. So, um, but when I came back from that experience, the thing about that experience is that, you know, it was, it was designed to throw me off before I really knew what was going on. So at the time that I was going to find an attorney, which is when they tackled me, um, having to do with this music industry stuff, which I thought was entirely linked to the Northwest, Pacific Northwest music industry and sub pop and people like that. At that time, I really thought it was all Pacific Northwest music industry. Um, I was staying in a hotel 
because it was a weekend and I was going, I was trying to prepare myself, get my computer ready. I wanted them to go through. My, I knew there was spyware in my computer. I wanted the attorney to, you know, I was hoping that I could find an attorney that would see how important my case was, not knowing that everybody knew already, um, and would work with me to expose the fact that it was my my computer was full of spyware, and um, so I was in this hotel room cleaning up you know, my own files, backing up my computer onto an external hard drive so that I could get some security professionals to look at it. That was my thought, that I would be able to do that. And um, we could proceed from there, okay? So I'm thinking, you know, I, had a, I had a plan forming in my head and I was making preparations for that. While I'm in this hotel room, um, the Grammy, some sort of pre-Grammy show is on and I started to see, based on this pre-Grammy show, that there was something bigger than just the Pacific Northwest music industry. I started to see a lot of stuff being expressed through the performances in the Grammys and started to understand that they were references to the situation. So that seemed a bit strange. I didn't really know what to make of it, but then I think it was Saturday Night Live or something, or maybe it was The Tonight Show. I can't remember which one it was. It was Saturday Night, so it was Saturday Night Live probably. Um, they did a skit on Saturday Night Live where they echoed Somebody did a dialogue that was an echo of something I had said to Chris in the bedroom a couple days before. So in other words, a bit of my personal conversation that happened in my bedroom between me and my intimate partner was repeated in a script on a skit on Saturday Night Live. This has happened several times since then. It's no big deal now. I, I'm used to it. But back then, I, it made me realize, wait a minute. This isn't just Seattle, you know, or Sub Pop or whatever spying on us. This is much, 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 much bigger than that. That's when I realized that. And um, I was being spied on in the hotel room at that time. So there was somebody parked nearby with this. They had a gold car parked out there. And he kind of looked like this big, you know, like somebody that would play like a, a mafia thug on a TV show. So there was a lot of acting, and I'm not saying this guy was an actor, because there were a lot of people that seemed like they were truckers and teamsters and, you know, those kinds of guys. There were definite real gangsters following me around, menacing me. I mean, there was a lot of that stuff going on, so I'm just kind of glossing over that right now. But this, before I arrived in this hotel room, um, all kinds of crazy stuff was going on on the road. Um, and police cars were following me too and things like that. Um, people were trying to, people were driving aggressively, people were doing all kinds of crazy stuff around me. Um, so I was driven out of that hotel room shortly after this. I was driven out at a specific time on purpose so that I would be back out on the road and vulnerable again. And um, that's when I, you know, for safety's sake, parked my car and called a friend to try to um, help me because I knew my car at that point, my car had been sabotaged. Okay, so that's, that's the sort of the a very quick summary of what was happening. This is the weekend of January. Um, they finally, they finally captured me, I believe on January 28th, 2014. But this is what had been planned out way, way, way ahead of time. And um, yes, people linked to Sub Pop and the North Pacific Northwest music industry were involved in the planning, but the funding came from somewhere else. So when I got back from all of this, and I was trying to figure out what do I do now, right? And I was continuing to research what the hell is going on. Um, I became aware that I was being stalked by, um, by stalked, I mean, watched online. And there's ways to tell this. Maybe I'll talk about it later. I don't really want to talk about it right now because I still like noticing who's watching me. Um, and I'll make it easier for them to hide if I tell them how I know. But I was being watched, first of all, by a group called the Vanguard Group, which is a huge investment firm, multi-billion dollar investment firm. Um, Disney Corporation being one of their biggest cu customers. They were watching me a lot. Um, another investment firm called Pioneer was watching me. And then there was a period of time when a whole bunch of labels, record labels, became apparent were watching me, including DECA, especially DECA, but also DECA and EMI. Those are DECA, EMI, and Atlantic are the three that I really noticed. 
So DECA immediately catches my eye because the Beatles were signed to DECA. So I remember, you know, the old Beatles records with the DECA logo on them. Now, I'm naive and kind of dumb, and so I'm thinking, wow, DECA Records is paying attention to me. That's kind of cool. Um, but no, maybe not so cool. Um, so now I feel like that um, as the Rolling Stones start to come into this, the pieces, there's something meeting, right? There's something, two points meeting where there was a gap in the, you know, a missing puzzle piece. Um, and there is a reason why the Rolling Stone magazine is called the Rolling Stone magazine and why John Lennon, dressed in a World War I army outfit, appeared on the cover of the first issue of the Rolling Stone. I don't remember exactly what date it was. I think it was November something, 1967, I believe. And in the photograph, he seems to look, there's a similarity between that photograph and a photograph of my Aunt Lucille from the 1920s. I think that too is deliberate. So there's a deliberate juxtaposition of Rolling Stone magazine, which people are going to link to the Rolling Stones as well as to the Muddy Waters song, as well as to the old saying, a Rolling Stone gathers no moss. So we have the Rolling Stone gathers no moss saying, we have the Muddy Waters song, Rolling Stone. We have the band name, the Rolling Stones, and now we have a music publication called The Rolling Stone with John Lennon on the cover, How I Won the War, a song, a, song, a movie about, in which he dies at the end, spoiler alert, um, his character dies at the end. Uh, I think the last, his last words are something like, I knew this would happen, something like that. Um, And the Beatles being linked to the Rolling Stones. I just realized that, you know, in the movie, John Lennon says, I knew this would happen, and his character is killed with a gunshot, and look what happened to John Lennon in 1980. So, um... <clears throat> so all of that stuff is relevant, and Rolling Stone gathers no moss. Moss is a name in my family tree. Moss. And it's not that the the guys in these bands are, you know, devising this stuff. They're play they're playing along with it because they want to have a career, I assume. But the industry itself is orchestrating this stuff. And the finance of the industry. So that Decca Records was looking and paying attention to me to online and stuff. Um, it wasn't because they were interested in my music or Chris's music, artistically or otherwise. And it's not because Chris isn't, you know, a worthy musician. It's because other stuff was going on. Um, and um, they were trying to actually destroy our music, actually. That's what was going on. Uh, not just DECA, but lots of linked groups. And since that time, they've done a lot to do that. They've physically attacked Chris. They've physically attacked me. They've attacked my daughter. They've um, continued to bury all history of us online and elsewhere. Um, and strings get pulled down the line so that even little local publications and the local community participates in this. Now, there's other reasons why the local community wants to participate in this, including all these freaking murders that have been going on, including Kurt Cobain and Elliot Smith, who are from um, the Pacific Northwest. I mean, Elliot Smith is really from Texas, but he moved to Portland and became involved with this group spying on, you know, taking advantage of exploiting Chris and I. Um, and not because he was a bad person, but because he was trying to ratchet up into a music career, I believe. I mean, it's just obvious. That's how everybody, you know, not everybody, maybe, I mean, everybody gets somewhere. So, um, why these murders are happening and what's behind all of that is a little bit still, I'm still putting that together, but, um, <clears throat> The Rolling Stones. Okay, so um, 
I started to, a lot of stuff starts falling into place when you look at the Rolling Stones as having a little bit more of a complex background in this than I had realized. Um, and other types of things like Jagger and the word Jag getting worked into, as I said yesterday, um, Jagged Little Pill. I know yesterday I said, yesterday I said wig out a Jag bag, Stephen Malkmus. But there's also things like Jagged Little Pill. And, um, other ways that this stuff is kind of seems like it's been worked in there that ways that I didn't realize um, Courtney Love this showed up in a dream last night uh, 2014 Courtney Love comes out I think it was 14 it might have been 13 but comes out with a song called you know my name right um, an echo of sympathy for the devil the Rolling Stones hope you can guess my name and sympathy for the devil also comes in to play it seems like in the Altamont situation that um murder that happened at the altamont speedway during a rolling stones concert it sounds like i think that a lot of that happened during um part of the set that featured sympathy for the devil um courtney loved getting a tattoo on her arm that says let it bleed a rolling stones album um so I had this dream about Mick Jagger and Dolly Parton, and I, the more I think about it, the more I'm concerned that maybe there's a plan to attack Dolly Parton, because and Chris. I already knew there was a plan to attack Chris, and Chris is not just a plan, but it's being, it's happening. Um, the wind is coming up harder now that I just said this. Um, and the reason why Dolly Parton is a likely candidate for, not the reason, but, you know, a sign that Dolly Parton is a likely candidate for an attack is the recent um, death of Kenny Rogers, who's a collaboration partner of hers, you know, is linked to her in people's minds because these, these attacks happen in linked pairs. So um, I feel that that dream was implicating Mick Jagger in a planned attack on, on Dolly Parton. Um, so, and also attacks on Chris. And the attacks on me are ongoing as well. So there's a plan to kill Chris. There's a plan to kill me and there's a plan to kill my daughter. And that's the truth. And the, anyone that thinks it's okay for us to sit here and we'll be just fine sitting in this place is wrong. They're lying or they're insane. There's just no, anybody that's paying attention cannot actually legitimately think this. And if you say you do, you're lying. So, um, okay, so that's what I think the meaning of that was. Um, but anyway, before I had all that figured out and everything, I had this dream about Mick Jagger and Dolly Parton. Um, I wake up and I go to my computer and I, there were some things like I was, I, in my dream it was kind of, there was the phrase check Wikipedia as far as the, you know, birthday of Dolly Parton was important and, um, or the age of Dolly Parton. And then um, also there was this imagery linked to this Rolling Stones video for a song called Doom and Gloom that I hadn't looked at for a few years, so I thought I'd look at that again. And um, of course, as I looked online, I saw that the Rolling Stones had released a new song and music video 16 hours earlier. So that song, I think, is called Living in a Ghost Town. It just came out yes, day before yesterday, I guess, or, you know, in European time. And um, so, um, first, so Rolling Stones had just released a song. I looked at that video once, I watched the video once and listened to the song once and I didn't, I was paying more attention to other stuff at that time. I can't remember why I thought that was important. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I dreamt about it, uh, Rolling Stones, right after that happened, before I knew it happened. But, um, a lot of the imagery in that video is the tube, London Underground, so the words tube. Again, there's a Nirvana song. Travel through a tr tube and end up in your infection. So, tube is linked with an infection in a Nirvana song. I think it's a song called 
drain you. And then um, underground, the idea of an underground sub pop is, stands for subterranean underground pop, according to them. Of course, there's this idea of soda pop and pop, you know. Um, Nirvana is lurking in the background with the Rolling Stones. And so in that song, Doom and Gloom, the chorus is something like sitting in the dirt, feeling kind of hurt. So I didn't, hadn't picked up on this before. Both of those um, words, dirt and hurt, rhyme with Kurt. And I'm going to look at that video more closely, but I under, what I'm starting to see now in that video is that this, this is kind of addressed to these um, zombie squads that patrol the streets of Portland and probably other cities as well that are financed from above and dogs is another word for them um, they basically seem to be paid by the music industry to harass musicians and to keep them under control they're part of the control system and they do include police and doctors but police and doctors are higher position but they also include just people walking around the streets and I'm not saying that the, the Rolling Stones video was, was aimed at police and doctors. They were aimed at street level bottom feeders is what I is what call it. It's bottom feeders because you're feeding from the bottom of this cascade of finance that's coming down. Um, and I think that smaller labels, you know, quote unquote independent labels, the ironically named perhaps independent labels are, you know, a little bit higher up in this hierarchy. Um, so Sub Pop, when they were formed, were, you know, a quote unquote independent label, but there was certainly a back door things going on with them. Anyhow, um, the Rolling Stones were doing basically what Beyonce was doing in formation, which is a call to arms this bottom feeder squad that's what it was but it was done so cleverly that I didn't get that at first because I didn't have the framework to understand it at that time I thought because the first one of the they're very these these music videos are really psychologically sophisticated and they they really do know their audiences and their multiple audiences so when I first saw that music video I understood it to be related to surveillance going on in my bedroom because the scene was evocative enough of my bedroom at the time to trigger that memory. So then immediately after that, I thought, well, this woman in this video is somehow supposed to represent me, but that's not really true. The woman in the video, who I think I said looks a little like Cheryl Crow, so the name Cheryl and the name Crow are probably both significant, Cheryl Crow. Uh, if, if she is intended to look like Sheryl Crow, I, there's probably other people that she's supposed to look like. Maybe people that I not even, don't even know who they are. Um, I think is it actually, there's actually kind of dangling stuff out. Just like Beyonce, when she's driving around in a blue, you know, vintage souped up car or something in, in formation or whatever that's a that's a little piece of bait that was thrown out and there's a car very much like that in front of that hero souls taco wagon which apparently has tainted my food um and i think the stones in that video were dangling out uh record deals and tours and things like that for wannabe musicians climbing up the ratchet system so um what when they say Kurt and Dirt, the fact that they rhyme with Kurt, that wasn't intended for me to pick up on that, and I didn't pick up on it at first. It was intended for other people who knew what happened to Kurt Cobain to pick up on it. And for them to be, to, to instigate their fear that they would be found out. And this is why the Pacific Northwest music history is so carefully scripted and why nobody is allowed to go off script. Nobody is allowed to interview, for example, Chris Newman about his history with Courtney Love or um, <laughs> to deviate from the standard story at all, really. I mean, they might seem like they do, but they don't. Um, and they're always talking to the same group of people over and over, and the same individuals are actually given... I mean, in Elliot Smith's case, there's actually a, a caretaker of his history. That's Larry Crane, who's linked to Olympia. Um, 
you know, and they, they put it in other ways. They call them an archivist or whatever. But no, they're, they're basically the person that is um, curating, curator is maybe what they call it. They're curating the myth. And the same is true of Cobain. And then if they do interview anybody who has, you know, a closer relationship, that person usually will demure or, you know, give minimal information. Chris Novoselic is an example of that. For example, Chris Novoselic did not speak with Everett True when Everett True tried to write a bi biography, quote-unquote biography, fictionalized biography of Nirvana, um, probably because he knew Everett True would lie. And he knew that Everett True um, was... Um, 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 I don't want to say deceptive, it's beyond deceptive. You know, a person that double crosses you or a person that um, is dangerously deceptive. So he, he must, you know, he obviously knew that and his response was not to speak to Everett True. His response has been to lay low and to, you know, kind of... But anyway, that so so that's what's going on is, yes, there was a planned attack on Kurt Cobain, planned out by multiple people, not just one or two people. There's a planned attack on Elliot Smith, planned out by multiple people, not just one or two people. These are assassinations done by entire communities. And this whole, you know, attacks that happened on Courtney Love was misdirection. But I suspect usually when these attacks happen that the people who are closest to the person that's being attacked don't know exactly what's going on. I think it's kept from the people that really care about the person because they don't want the, you know, the person, they don't want their victim to be tipped off. So I think that's what the Stones were doing. They were basically triggering fears in people that they would be found out in their um, assassinations of people within their own community, music-wise. And now what the Stones' motivation is, that's for me to find out, I guess probably financial and professional, mostly.